Um, just so you know, Chairman Tester, he'll be along in a little bit, but we're going to go ahead and start today. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And I want to thank our friends uh, on the other side of the aisle in the Capitol for hosting our first joint hearing of the 118th Congress. It is our honor uh, to join, be joined by friends. Uh, uh, as I said, Chairman Tesker will be along later, uh, Ranking Member Moran, Ranking Member Takano, and in welcoming you to today's joint VSO hearing. Now, before I begin, I want to welcome Commander Joe uh, Persetic. I want to make sure I get it right, and the whole DAV team who are with us today. I also want to welcome his wife, Meg, uh, and thank you for your service as well to this nation, ma'am. I also want to welcome the DAV members that are here from Illinois, and if I can, I would like for the Illinois members, if you could please stand, I want to recognize you. Absolutely no one here from Illinois, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> there are some from Tennessee. All right. <laughs> Just so you know. There you go. <laughs> so I've been attending these VSO hearings for nine years now as a member of the committee, but this is the first time I'm doing so as chairman. Let me first off say that it is very humbling and an honor to do that. Um, I could have never dreamed that an enlisted Marine, corporal by the way, from Southern Illinois, would be sitting in a seat today that is the chairman of the committee charged with fighting for our nation's men and women in uniform. You know, it's a deep honor, and it's not a responsibility that I take lightly. But as you all know, it is not about me. It is about you and the millions of veterans and voices you represent across this country, our brothers and sisters in arms. You understand the struggles veterans and their families face. You know where VA is falling short. The DAV's uh, suburb, superb advocates in DC have made a tremendous difference. And we thank you for that. You have my commitment that we will fight for you and that voices of the representatives just as hard as you fought for us. And you know better than anyone else that the veteran community has earned a system that works for them. And I'm proud of all of that we've accomplished together this last Congress, including the president signing into the Bipartisan Pact Act into law. The legislation means a lot to veterans and their families, and it was a long overdue. And I was extremely proud to see it land on the president's desk. Now, we will be focusing on how VA implements that law. We will need all of you to let us know what is happening out there in the field when it comes to wait times for toxic exposed veterans care and claims decisions. Boots on the ground testimonials and virtually are vitally important for our oversight of the PACT Act. We have also made great progress to expand mental health opportunities through the Fox Grant program and the Strong Act to support the veterans and their families. And we continue to see a decline at the, as a veterans homeless nation, nationwide. However, our work is not finished. Veterans are still fighting a VA bureaucracy to access health care they want and when and where they need it. Being discriminated against and having their Second Amendment rights taken away from them if they need help managing their, their health benefits. During long-awaited times for either access to earned benefits or getting a simple question answered, dealing with, dealing with underperforming VA employees who don't have the veterans' best interest in mind, and reeling with the impacts of a flawed implementation of a new electronic health record system. These might seem like small things, but when it comes, to, to, comes down to it, they add up, and they impact veterans every single day. I'm focused on bringing a VA into the 21st century, even if it's going to do it kicking and screaming, to ensure generations of veterans have access to good care and services that they have earned. And I will ensure the VA getting the budget it needs to complete its mission. Now, I look forward to accomplishing that 
go alongside with alongside of you. And I thank you all uh, again for being here today. And with that, I want to uh, turn it over to Mr. Takano, the ranking member, uh, for his comments. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Boss. Uh, and it is wonderful to see a Marine veteran corporal <laughs> in the chairman's seat. Um, so congratulations. Uh, so it's great to be back in open format, uh, in person. First of all, the, the most important question of the day uh, is, are there any Californians in the room? <laughs> Welcome, California. Uh, it's an honor to join all of the members of the House and Senate committees on Veterans Affairs to hear uh, directly from the National Commander and representatives of disabled American uh, veterans. The opportunity to hear from our VSO partners is incredibly important to me. Partners like DAV represent veterans and their families at all stages of life and service. And hearing from these partners allows the committees the opportunity to hear directly about what is most important to your members and how we can be uh, of service to our nation's veterans. For example, for years we have heard from members of many VSOs uh, about taking comprehensive action on the effects of toxic exposure. I was encouraged to see the overwhelming support that DAV and other VSOs provided last Congress to pass my bill, the Honoring Our Pact Act, and get it signed into law. Thank you for the tremendous support you provided throughout the process. Getting the Pact Act to President Biden's desk is a testament to the strong advocacy and support from passionate groups like yours. I also would like to express my thanks to Chairman Tester, Ranking Member Moran, and Chairman Boss for their efforts to work with me on passing this law. Our bipartisan bill expands VA health care to over 3.5 million veterans living with the effects of toxic exposure. Our bill removes the burden of proof, which for too long has prevented toxic exposed veterans from accessing the care and benefits they need to treat their rare conditions. In total, the PACT Act establishes a presumption of service connection to 23 respiratory illnesses and cancers. Thank you, thank you for your help. Blue Water Navy veterans waited more than 40 years for benefits related to Agent Orange exposure because of Congress's piecemeal solutions. We were not going to let this happen again. And thanks to our efforts last Congress, we kept our promise. Now the hard work begins, and I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues to make sure this transformational law is implemented effectively. In the last Congress together, we secured several important wins for veterans, including, as already mentioned, the passing of the Landmark Pact Act. In addition, passing the, via, the Veteran Auto and, uh, and Education Improvement Act, the Military Sexual Trauma Claims Coordination Act, the Remote Act, the Thrive Act, and the Sergeant Ketchum Rural Veterans Mental Health Act, we were also able to wrap up the 117th Congress with packages of veterans legislation, including the Strong Veteran Act and the Cleveland Dole Memorial Veterans Benefits and Health Care Impro Improvement Act. I'm very proud of these accomplishments, but we need to build on these achievements and continue our fight for better health care and benefits in this Congress and beyond. Now, reading your testimony, it is clear your priorities align with my own. My priorities for this Congress include opposing efforts to cut over $31 billion in VA funding, including funding for the 3.5 million newly eligible toxic exposed veterans, preserving women veterans' freedoms, delivering a VA for all veterans, modernizing VA care for the next generation of veterans, ensuring that no veteran is forgotten, and working to end veteran homelessness and food insecurity, ensuring benefits parity for America's veterans, rejecting efforts to privatize VA, conducting critical oversight and implementation of suicide prevention and toxic exposure bills, and empowering VA to fulfill, to fulfill its fourth mission capabilities. So we have big goals, but I know with your support and insight here today, along with the support of the Biden-Harris administration, we will be able to achieve these goals and fulfill the sacred promises we made to our nation's veterans. So I look forward to hearing your testimony today, and thank you for your continued advocacy and support. 
uh, for the veteran community. And thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Takano. And at this time, we'd like to recognize the Ranking Member of the Senate uh, VA Committee, uh, Senator Moran. Chairman Bost, uh, Ranking Member Takano, uh, welcome to the United States Senate. On behalf of Senator Tester and my Senate colleagues, we're glad to have you here. And uh, congratulations to you, Chairman Bost, on your ascension. Uh, I can tell you, uh, Congressman Takano, uh, all leadership here is fleeting. It can change every two years. I've experienced it myself. So there's, uh, hang in there and there's hope. Uh, <laughs> uh, welcome to our DAV witnesses uh, this morning and I thank uh, all of you uh, across this room and across the country who are watching at home for joining us, to hear, joining us here today. I especially thank my DAV members from Kansas who met with me uh, earlier this week uh, in my office and had uh, significantly valuable and enjoyable conversations. I thank them for their leadership uh, at home and here in, in the Washington, D.C. I want to thank the DAV leaders uh, for being here in person. Thank you for your passion and expertise in supporting veterans. The knowledge you have of veterans and their families are hugely important to us and the experiences each of you have encountered in your lives. Uh, allow us to, to fashion legislation and to lobby the Department of Veterans Affairs to do things in a way that benefit uh, all veterans. My view is that we've accomplished uh, a lot working together. We've accomplished a lot in recent years, and I expect bipartisan efforts to continue in this Congress, and I know the DAV will continue to advocate, and, uh, to advocate uh, for those uh, legislative improvements. A couple of things I want to highlight. Next month marks two significant anniversaries. March the 20th will be 20 years since the start of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Millions of U.S. service members and their families have and continue to serve and sacrifice to defeat our enemies. We remember all those who gave their lives in that conflict and we commit to taking care of their surviving families. March the 29th marks 50 years since the end of U.S. forces combat operations in Vietnam. To all our veterans, we say what should have been said to every one of them 50 years ago, welcome home. We recognize and honor your service to our country and we commit to seeing that you receive the support and gratitude that many did not receive those 50 years ago. Commander Partizic, uh, DAV's advocacy and its partnership will be vital as we go forward, as we work to make certain that veterans and their survivors can access the care and benefits they deserve in a timely, effective manner that delivers positive, measurable outcomes. The legislative accomplishments that you've helped achieve are important. Some receive little attention and some receive a lot of attention, but each one of those successes are worthy on behalf of our veterans. Now we must all work together to see that the VA Mission Act, the Hannon Mental Health Care Improvement Act, and the PACT Act are implemented and adhered to in a way that Congress and the legislative intent that you helped create is fulfilled. I will keep working to make certain the VA has everything it needs to deliver the care and benefits under these new laws, and we will count on the DAV to help us identify where additional resources or legislative changes are required. Thank you again, Commander, for your testimony, and I look forward to hearing it, and I yield back. Senator Moran, thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I'm a bit late, um, but it's great to be here with Congressman Bost and Takano and my good friend Jerry Moran. Um, I've got a big advantage today in that um, Joe Parsetich is from the state of Montana, so I get to watch you guys butcher his name uh, <laughs> up, up and down. Well, you've missed uh, it because we've been doing real well. Up and down the rostrum. <laughs> not, to, not to Parsetich. I'm uh, not to point anything out, Jerry, but uh, I'd even got a laugh out of Joe. So just, uh, just so you know. Uh, but good morning uh, to the DAV, C Commander Parsetich. Uh, uh, you've come a long ways because uh, I made the same flight yesterday. Uh, and uh, you've been a good friend, and I want to welcome you to Washington, D.C., and this, this joint committee. Uh, and I also want to welcome Ken Weinheimer, uh, Chase, Natalie, uh, Kevin Grantier, and anybody else from Montana who made the, the trek 
Um, I look forward to meeting with all of you uh, later in the day. You know, Congress relies on the DAV uh, and your team of advocates in Washington to keep us surprised of the needs of veterans and how we can meet those needs. None more important, by the way, than our disabled veterans. Last year, your support was critical in helping Congress address the longstanding priority of caring for toxic exposed veterans and doing right by those who have served this country. The Sergeant for Class Heath Robinson honoring our PACT Act is the largest expansion of VA care and benefits in decades, and we couldn't have gotten it done without the DAV. Now we turn our attention to implementation of this law and ensuring the Department has the capacity to deliver the timely care and benefits that veterans deserve. This means addressing VA staffing shortages, offering more competitive salaries and benefits. It means fostering a culture that tracks and retains the best and the brightest, and it also means building and maintaining modern facilities. By the way, none of this is going to be done if we roll the budget back five years, okay? Uh, this Congress uh, and our committee are leading bipartisan, common-sense efforts to build on historic investments made by this PACT Act, the VA Careers Act, Build Act for Veterans Act, both crafted and supported by the DAV. Uh, we must also address an injustice that's been impacting medically retired veterans for far too long that as I told the American Legion this morning, makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. We need to get the Major Richard Starr Act passed. It is a top priority of mine. It ensure <clears throat> it in this bill that you guys are very familiar with ensures that our combat injured veterans will receive full DOD and VA benefits that they have earned. We couldn't have gotten the PACT Act done without you and other VSO partners, and the same goes for the Major Richard Starr Act. We'll need your support. We'll need your strong support and advocacy to get this bad boy across the finish line. Together, I'm confident that uh, we will get this uh, to get this right. And uh, Commander Parsetic and your team, we have a lot to get to. Uh, your voice is invaluable in prioritizing our efforts on these two committees. And we thank you. We thank you for your work on behalf of disabled veterans, but we thank your membership for the sacrifices that they've given to this country, and they have been great. And with that, I'll turn the podium over to you, Joe. Uh, good luck. Oh, God, you're right. I, I screwed up. I've got voluminous things to say about Joe Barsetich. It is... Uh, it is now my pleasure to, I thought everybody knew him, right, Jerry? Uh, in, uh, inter introduce uh, DAV's national com uh, commander, a, a Montana boy who hails from Great Falls, as a stone's throw away from my hometown of Big Sandy. He's a Vietnam veteran. Joy, Joe served honorably in the U.S. Air Force and is himself a service-connected disabled veteran. Widely known as a champion for veterans of Montana across the nation, Joe was elected this summer to serve as DAV's national commander, and I might say that was a damn good choice. He understands the challenges rural veterans face and convey the expertise to the VA from his role on the Veterans Rural Health Advisory Committee. He has also served on many other exec executive committees and governance bodies, working on veteran suicide prevention and addressing veterans' homelessness and much, much, much more. Joe and his wife Meg have a family that includes seven children, three foster children, 32 grandchildren, eight grandchildren. I don't know how the hell you do it, man, I'll tell you. <laughs> Even with his service commitments and, and a family with more members in this committee, uh, he finds time to serve veterans in his community as a volunteer in DAV's Transportation Network and on the Honor Guard. Joe, uh, I can't thank you enough for being here today. More importantly, I want to thank you for your service and your tireless commitment to the military and veterans community. Uh, Joe Parsetich, Commander Parsetich, you may now introduce your leadership team and begin with your opening statement, and I hope I didn't miss anything. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Chairman Tester, Chairman Boss, Ranking Members Moran and Takano, and members of the Committees on Veterans Affairs, Thank you for providing me the opportunity to deliver the 2023 legislative program of DAV, Disabled American Veterans, an organization of more than one million members, all of whom were injured or became ill as a result of wartime service. 
My written statement thoroughly details DAB's key legislative priorities for the 118th Congress and reports on our many programs and accomplishments. So today, I'm just gonna highlight some of our more critical policy goals. But first, I'd like to start off by introducing my DAV colleagues joining me here today. National Adjutant Mark Burgess, National Headquarters Executive Director Barry Jesenowski, Washington Headquarters Executive Director Randy Reese, National Service Director Jim Marsalak, National Legislative Director Joy Elam, National Voluntary Services Director John Kleindeist, National Employment Director Ryan Burgos, and National Auxiliary Commander Darlene Spence. In addition to those here with me today, many more DAV members are together watching this hearing from our annual Midwinter Conference across the river in Arlington. And there are thousands of dedicated DAV members across the country also watching and supporting us from their hometowns. I also want to recognize the many DAV leaders who have been vital to our organization's mission over the course of many years including my senior and junior vice commanders and leaders in our DAV auxiliary. Let me also extend my gratitude to our National Executive Committee and the members of the National Legislative Interim Committee, as well as my Chief of Staff, Danny Oliver, for their continued support. And finally, I want to thank my wife, Meg, who remains my most steadfast supporter and partner. Mr. Chairman, I am a service-connected disabled Air Force veteran of the Vietnam War. At just 17 years old, I requested assignment in Vietnam, where I served as a military policeman with the 377th Security Police Squadron in the guard towers on Tonsonute Air Base from 1968 to 1969. And although I didn't know it then, the truth is my time in Vietnam lived with me long after I returned home. I don't have any John Wayne stories from my time in theater, and fortunately I didn't experience any physical injuries. But for many years, I couldn't shake the sounds of the enemy rockets whistling past my post, and I brought back with me the memories of those who lost their lives over there. I was honorably discharged in 1972 and carried the burden of surviving Vietnam for decades until 2009, when I woke up in an intensive care unit. That's because after 59 years on this beautiful earth, I no longer saw my life as being valuable. I saw myself as an unworthy burden to those around me, and I attempted to end it all. Mr. Chairman, I sit before you today with the humble admission that I've never been so happy or so fortunate to have failed at something. So from personal experience, I know just how important veterans' access to mental health services are. DAV appreciates Congress's continued attention to this issue and the significant resources provided to support the VA's inclusive array of specialized mental health programs and services. As these needs continue to grow, it's crucial that Congress provide the VA with all the mental health resources, staffing, and support necessary to provide for, to pre prevent, excuse me, veteran suicide. We appreciate Congress's recent enactment of the comprehensive mental health legislation aimed at reducing barriers to care for veterans in crisis by collaborating with community partners. We all have to play a role. DAV has a mentorship program that su supports alternative programming to help veterans overcome difficult transitional challenges after their deployment is over. Through our Charitable Service Trust, the DAV provided $2.2 million in grants to support Save a Warrior, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing a unique healing outlet and intensive therapy options for veterans combating mental health issues. DAV has also provided nearly $1 million to Boulder Crest Retreats, where DAV leaders and spouses serve as mentors for the latest generation of seriously injured veterans and their caregivers. DAV has also been a longtime partner in co-hosting our annual National Disabled Veterans Winter Sports and Golf Clinics. 
We are very proud of these adaptive sports programs that directly impact and transform the lives and mental well-being of our most profoundly injured veterans. We can and we must do more to end the national tragedy of veteran suicide. There is no more fundamental obligation of our nation than to care for the men and women who were forever changed in wartime service. Over the past decade, the VA has experienced unprecedented stress trying to fulfill that sacred charge, and they've undertaken historic reforms to ensure veterans have timely access to earned benefits and high-quality health care. The DAV is proud to provide ill and injured veterans free representation with filing claims for the service-related conditions, and we have the largest and most well-trained benefits advocacy initiative in the country, with over one million veterans choosing DAV to represent them. Last year, our nationwide core of 3,700 benefits experts took more than 2.4 million actions to advocate for veterans and their families and file claims for their earned benefits more than any other organization. <laughs> Messrs. Chairman, DAV is a fierce advocate of the VA healthcare system and its specialized programs. Over the past decade, there has been one consistent trend an increasing number of veterans continuing to choose the VA for their medical needs. Unfortunately, the rising demand for care, coupled with significant staffing shortages and an aging infrastructure, continues to outstrip the VA's capacity to provide timely and convenient access for all veterans enrolled in the VA healthcare system. This is especially critical for disabled veterans who rely on the VA for most or all of their care. Congress must ensure that VA has the resources necessary to maintain sufficient staffing to deliver timely care and serve as the primary care provider and coordinator for all veterans using the VA system. And that is why we also ask that funding increases, not funding cuts, be implemented. You know, the VA and Congress must work together to modernize, realign, and rebuild our aging medical infrastructure to meet the veterans' health care needs both now and in the future. In DAB, we call upon you and your colleagues to work in concert with the VA to develop a workable infrastructure plan and authorize sufficient funding to address this longstanding issue. The VA must have modern facilities to efficiently deliver quality care to the veterans who have earned it. <laughs> to help veterans access VA health care, DAV also operates a national transportation network offering veterans free transportation to and from VA health care facilities. You know, last year, DAV volunteers drove more than 500,000 hours, transporting more than 200,000 veterans to their medical appointments, saving taxpayers more than $16 million. <laughs> and Messrs. Chairman, providing safe, high-quality health care requires a modern electronic health record system. Unfortunately, VA's initial HR uh, EHR rollout resulted in some serious concerns about patient safety and training. We know this is a complex issue, but whatever decisions Congress makes on the path forward, it is essential that veterans' safety and health outcomes remain the first priority. <laughs> Another DAV critical goal for the 118th Congress is to ensure equity in services, benefits, and health outcomes for all underserved veteran populations, including our women veterans. And despite shifts in policy and increased staff training, evidence still suggests that many underserved populations are still at higher risk for health disparities and suicide. 
If the VA is to live up to its mission to care for those who have borne the battle, it must rebuild trust, tailor programs to meet the unique needs, and ensure a safe and welcoming environment for all veterans that it serves. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, it is critical to support the veterans during their transition from military service to civilian life, and DAV is committed to providing <laughs> veterans and their spouses with the tools, resources, and opportunities to pursue meaningful careers or even start their own business. Last year, we hosted over 80 job fairs across the country, and our efforts resulted in thousands of job offers to the veterans and their spouses. And the DAV also now helps veterans and their spouses pursue their dreams as entrepreneurs so they can become job creators and benefits providers for veterans. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Chairman, we thank you and all of your members here today for the historic passage of the Honoring Our PAC Act. With the enactment of this legislation, millions of veterans exposed to burn pits and other toxic substances are now eligible for VA's life-changing benefits and health care. Now it's up to Congress to ensure that this law is fully and faithfully implemented. We need you to monitor the number and type of PAC Act claims filed. We must make certain that the VA has the resources and staffing to provide timely decisions and benefits to all toxic exposed veterans and their survivors. <laughs> For over 100 years, DAV has been providing critical services and support to our nation's ill and injured veterans. Through our programs, million plus members, volunteers, and supporters we provide direct help to those who need it. That is our mission. Film producer Maria Cuomo Cole said that we must give veterans the tools to empower themselves and reclaim the self-worth and dignity which comes from occupying a place in the American dream. It is a dream that they fought so hard to defend for the rest of us. If ever there was a need for us to focus our efforts to be united, to be the best, and to rise to meet the occasion, this is it. Our veterans need and are, need us and are worth the fight, and together we have the opportunity and the obligation to do better. Mr. Chairman, this completes my testimony. May God bless the DAV, the men and women who have served our great nation, their families, their survivors and caregivers, and of course, this wonderful country, the United States of America. Commander Percentage, thank you very much. A few housekeeping uh, things to begin with. First of all, the questions will be three-minute rounds, so pick your best question. Uh, and then, uh, Commander Percentage, uh, questions will be directed to you, but you can defer to anybody in your in your in your leadership team. And and I will I will go first. Uh, Commander Percentage, uh, about two years ago, Senator Bozeman and, and I. Um, uh, sponsored a bill called the Deborah Sansom Act, and we got it across the finish line. But we got it on across the finish line because the DAV, who has been a long a champion for women veterans, was a major force in getting that job done. Uh, two years ago, post enactment now of Deborah Sansom, how well do you think the VA is doing implementing the law, and what gaps still remain? Need to push on your mic. Thank you for the question, Senator, because the VA has been working on implementing the Deborah Sampson Act. We have a good groundwork laid. There's still a lot of work to do, a lot of gaps that we, we have. I'm going to direct that question to uh, Director Elam to expound on that a little bit more, if I may. Okay, Joy. Thank you, Commander. We want to thank um, you specifically on the Deborah Sampson Act, but everyone working together to really um, make sure that our nation's women veterans um, were a priority. 
And while the Deborah Sampson Act has so many great provisions in it, it does take time for implementation. Um, I think that you know VA still struggles with hiring enough women uh, veteran providers that have expertise in women's health. Um, and if I had to say one other point would be to make sure that their anti-harassment campaign is, um, you know, they're fully staffed and they can really work on that issue. I don't think that is quite where we want it to be yet, although it's got a good start. It's going to take a lot of work to complete that. But we do appreciate all the work on women veterans that's been done. Oversight will be essential and holding hearings and roundtables, I think, to make sure VA completes all of the provisions and in, within that bill, that important bill. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much. Uh, the PACT Act's been talked about a bit here this morning. Um, DAV uh, and its service officers are, 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 are eyes and ears on the ground, and we need to ensure the VA implements the PACT Act properly. For you, Commander Porsetich, or your team, has VA included you, the DAV, in PACT Act implementation? You know, we've been in very close uh, communication with the Secretary. He shared with us as far as staffing needs uh, for both uh, from a funding perspective as well as facilities. DAV is well plugged into VA. Their passion to implement this much needed uh, bill is, um, is tremendous. Um, but I'm gonna ask um, Director Marslack if he can expound a little bit further on that, if I may. Thank you, Commander. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, we've been working very closely with Josh Jacobs and his team. We think it's more collaboration now than ever. Uh, they've really pulled us in, working on overdevelopment tax task force. But it's critical that we ensure they have the resources necessary to be able to process these claims, not only timely, but accurately. We want decisions right the first time. So we're paying very, very close attention. We urge Congress to make sure that we're taking a look at the number of claims that are filed, the decisions that are made, the denials, and why they're being denied. So we got to continue to work together. Thank you all for being here. And by the way, it's great to have a crowd meeting in person again. Beats the hell out of teleconference. And Senator Moran. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'll, I'll call your fellow uh, resident of Montana by the name I can pronounce, Commander, uh, good day. Uh, <laughs> Senator Tester may try to demonstrate that he's smarter than I am, but I think I can find a way to prove that we at least have equal intelligence. Uh, I am pleased that you're here, and I appreciate the testimony, and I listened closely. I uh, stepped out to speak to a couple of uh, groups of University of Kansas and Kansas State University students who are uh, in the Capitol today, and I told them of your presentation and why we were here. And I was pleased to hear them say uh, what respect they had for veterans and uh, wanted to make sure that they gave me the instructions, these 19, 20 year old kids, to make sure that we take care of those who served our nation. And we want to do that. Um, let me ask, I guess, in my three minutes, my priority question. Um, Congress is, has never failed to provide resources that the VA needs to care for veterans. Sometimes this takes us a little while to get it done. Uh, we're not going to miss the opportunity to make sure the resources are there. I'm an appropriator as well as a member of this committee. You can see that in significant budget increases that the VA continues to receive year after year, even when we supposedly have strict austerity measures in place from the rest of government. But the VA is not immune from waste, fraud, abuse, uh, I heard you testify particularly about infrastructure and buildings. What would be your suggestion for ways that we can find uh, the necessary resources to put into those new structures? It probably takes reducing or eliminating structures that are no longer important, but as, or as important, but those are difficult priorities to make, and we need your help in trying to reach a conclusion about how we can spend less here on something that is deteriorating to make sure we have something new and available for veterans uh, across our nation. So a bit of an infrastructure question, but also anything that you see in which the VA uh, could do a better job in being more efficient. Thank you for that question, Senator or Congressman, because it is critically important. Um, and also thank you for your constituents' uh, kind, kind comments. But I'm glad you brought that up because our men and women have already paid the price 
once to this country, we shouldn't have to pay the price a second time as far as you have the facilities and services that we have earned. That being said, however, having updated facilities are very important, but not to the extent where we close the other ones that exist prior to having the new ones in place so that our veterans out in remote areas can still access the healthcare facilities that they need to address their uh, injuries or illnesses that they're receiving uh, services from. I thank you for your answer, and uh, I share with uh, your state, Kansas shares that rural aspect for access to care. Part of that is the Mission Act, but part of that is making sure the facilities, the physical facilities we have in the VA are updated, and we ought not discriminate as, against a single veteran by where he or she lives. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Moran. Senator Murray. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Commander, welcome. It's great to have you here. And I can say Parsetich because I'm from the great state of Washington. My mother was born in Butte, so Senator Chester has nothing on me there, so great. <laughs> Good to have you here, and thank you for your comments. Thank you to all of your members who are here supporting you and all of your team and for all the work that you do. Um, I appreciate your answer to Senator Tester on the Deborah Sampson Act, and know we have more work to do there, as well as making sure that we have the resources for the VA to implement the PACT Act. Um, but in my few minutes, I did want to talk about the millions of children who are living with a disabled veteran and how we make sure we're taking care of them as well. Senator Bozeman, who just left, and I are introducing the Helping Heroes Act that will help support the families of disabled veterans, and including those children who are taking on caregiving roles. Because I really believe that we have a serious obligation to support our veterans when they come home, and that includes supporting the children and grandchildren of those veterans who are helping care for their families. So I want to ask you today about um, how and how, what else we can do, what the VA should be doing to support those families who are supporting veterans. Thank you for that question, because I think that the very start of the solution for that is just what you brought out, your compassion and obvious recognition of how, the criticalness of making sure that our veterans, families, and caregivers do have adequate compensation so that they can stay home and take care of their loved ones who came back with some ill or injured um, conditions. Uh, Director Elam, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I would just add, you know, we're happy to support your bill. And it is important to remember that the entire family is impacted. And obviously, the children of service disabled veterans, our members are fully aware of that. And, and we're happy to support that legislation. Thank you very much. And I will yield back my time to many members here. But thank you all again for all the work you do. Senator Murray, thank you. Uh, Representative Rosendale. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Commander Porsetich, Joe, and the rest of the disabled American veterans for coming to Washington, D.C. to testify before us. I enjoyed meeting with your uh, whole delegation yesterday, Ken Weyenheimer, Kevin Grantier, and Chase Natalie yesterday, and always value your insight on veterans' issues. Commander Persetich is from my district, and uh, I have my first granddaughter there in Great Falls, so I'm hoping maybe she will grow up with one of your 25 uh, that you've already got going there. Um, I really appreciate your willingness to speak so openly about your own personal battle with PTSD. Your bravery serves in as, as an inspiration for other veterans who are facing similar challenges and makes them more likely to come forward and get the treatment that they deserve. That is really, really admirable, and I appreciate it. I agree with your written testimony that the Oracle Cerner electronic health record system initial rollout in Spokane, Washington, resulted in serious concerns pertaining to patient safety and led to the burnout among staff. It was a really big problem. As chairman of the Technology Modernization Subcommittee, I introduced the Department of Veteran Affairs Electronic Health Record Modernization Termination Act which ends the Oracle Cerner EHR system. We must hold the VA to a high standard of care promised to our veterans and be good stewards of taxpayers' dollars. I welcome the opportunity to work with you to ensure that we have an EHR system that works for our veterans. We absolutely cannot be putting the safety of our veterans at risk 
by dumping money into a system yeah. that has failed and shown that it's not functioning properly. Can you please touch on some of the problems your members have experienced with the Oracle Cerner EHR system? Thank you so much for that question, Congressman, because, you know, you know how much I respect you and all of the 535 men and women on the body, but I would encourage you not to throw out the baby with the bathwater because, yes, it had problems when it first came out, but rather than, you know, doing away with it, we just need to dig in and fix those problems because it's the start of a tremendous process that's going to enable the veterans to get better quality care by having the collaboration between the various physicians, something that's been lacking right now because if they don't get the hard copy medical records, um, many times the veterans find that they're starting over or a contraindication or a problem that they may have been encountering with the first time, the new person's not going to know. So the electronic record system is so critical. And you're right, we need repairs on it. But again, repairs don't come by doing away with it completely. So I would just ask that uh, we would continue to get the support that's going to benefit the veterans in a safe and effective manner and enhance the physician's capability to give us the best quality care possible. Thank you so much. I see my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commander. Thank you so much. We appreciate that each of you are here. And in Tennessee, we really appreciate the work that DAV and the, S the VSOs do for our veterans. And uh, Commander, I want to go back to something you said in your testimony about access to care in a timely manner. And I agree with you that that access to care in a timely manner should be a top priority of this committee. And that is why I've been such a proponent of expanding the Veterans Community Care Program so that veterans can get that. When you look at uh, wait times in Tennessee, and uh, sometimes it's 100 days to get a primary care appo uh, appointment, and that is not acceptable. And this program's success is going to be vitally important to the proper implementation of the PACT Act. So. I'd like to know if DAV has done any outreach to educate veterans on the community care program and informing them when they are eligible for this care, allowing veterans to make informed decisions about how they seek their care, whether they want it through the VA system or in their local communities. I know many times uh, it's hard to get somebody to take off work and get you 180 miles to um, the VA. And I find it inappropriate that many times the VA is the middleman between the veteran and that access to care. So if you would speak to that. You bet. And thank you for that question because... You know, one of the things, I'll answer your question first as far as where you asked if the DAV is doing anything proactive to get the word out how to circumvent and, you know, interact with the community care process. Our NSOs nationwide, national service officers, are putting out what's called information seminars where the entire community, not just our DAV members, are invited to, to address these various things, um, questions, um, procedural type things. Um, because so many times various issues come up where they say, well, should we do this or should we do that? And they're listening to their neighbors and not knowledgeable people. So, yes, DAV is very proactive when it comes to getting the word out. Also, through our commercials that we try to have in our website is very informative. But for those who are not part of our member, the veterans nationwide are able to access that information. But also, when it comes to you know, a little bit further knowledge. I'm going to see if uh, Director Elam can expound a little bit. I would just add that um, community care network is an important part of uh, VA health care. And while we want to make sure that VA can be a primary provider and coordinator of that care, we know that VA can't be in every location, and there's oftentimes when veterans 
have to seek care in the community. We want to see improvements in that care um, transition, that process, because we think that's where a lot of the delays are occurring. So we're um, on board. We want to help make sure that smooth transition veterans get care when they need it, where they need it. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Brzezinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and it's great to be with you, Commander. Um, and to, uh, thank you to all of the disabled American veterans for being here today. Um, you know, as well documented, suicide rates for our veterans um, are at a historic high. In fact, veterans are one and a half times more likely to die by suicide than non-veterans. We know there are many reasons for this, including trauma experience while in service, stress, burnout, isolation, and difficulties transitioning back to civilian life. So I want to thank you, Commander, for sharing in your testimony your personal experience and your story, um, which for me, representing the 13th District in Illinois, is not unique for many of the veterans that I have the privilege of representing. So my question for you, Commander, is in your opinion and from your professional and personal experiences, what are some of the actions that Congress needs to take to improve access to behavioral health services for our veterans? Thank you. You're welcome, and thank you for that question. Um, one of the challenges that not just the military environment with veterans face, as well as civilian sectors, is that many times the invisible traumatic scars of injuries, whether it be, like I said, as a child, as a person who's been violated, whether it be as women or men, but especially our military, when they come back, many of them that are faced with the invisible scars are not getting the support that many who have the visible wounds are getting as far as the way of encouragement, validation that's lacking. And after a while, those who are struggling with those invisible scars start believing in, sometimes we're even given judgmentalism, which makes you question whether or not you know, why you should even be in that state. So I think with the VA's thrust to make more services available to the veterans and their families, because they have many support groups for vet veterans who are having suicidal tendencies or have dealt with those in the past, um, the VA has come a long way. And we just want to make sure that they have adequate funding and staffing to continue with the progress that they've been making so far and need to continue to make. Thank you, and I'll yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, um, Rank Member Moran, and to Ranking Members and Chairs uh, in both chambers for this hearing. Thank you, uh, Commander Persetic, for testifying before us today, and to add to the Congresswoman's uh, comments for being so candid. It's really, really important. Um, in New Hampshire, many veterans have to travel significant distances for their VA health care, as we've been talking about. And in many places, there is no public transportation available. For disabled veterans or those simply without a car, this is a huge barrier to care and can lead to veterans missing appointments, among other things. As a result, many Granite State veterans turn to DAV's dedicated network of volunteer drivers who drive them to their VA health care free of charge. And Commander, I understand that you volunteer to do this driving as well, so thank you very much. The service that DAV drivers are providing is critical to veterans accessing care, and it provides a lifeline for many disabled veterans. So how can the VA better support DAV's volunteer drivers, and what could the VA do to ensure that no veteran has to worry about finding a ride to an appointment. Thank you for that question, because I'm very passionate about that. This country is not lacking in volunteers wanting to serve the veterans by volunteering, driving, helping out in different facilities. And problems with getting volunteers processed and cleared to be able to volunteer is not coming from the federal level. National VA is very, very supportive. But we find nationwide that the lack of communication between the director encouraging the voluntary services to get these applications processed in an expedient fashion, dragging out for three to six months or longer in many cases, is just unacceptable. So I think it's going to come from, to use a secular term, we need to have some coaching going on. 
first from the VA to the director saying, hey, you need to get busy with coaching your voluntary services people, and then voluntary services approaching it with the severity and the criticalness of getting those drivers cleared because it's like you pointed out, it's critical to getting these veterans to their medical appointments and many times they can make the difference of life or death in many cases. Thank you for that question. Well, thank you so much and thank you for your service. Uh, and I will yield back and uh, submit a couple more questions, particularly about the caregiver program for the record. Thank you. Senator, thank you. Senator Tuberville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by saying thank you to disabled American veterans for everything you do, day in and day out for veterans across the world. To address PTSD and TBI, veterans are trying innovative alternate treatments and therapies through clinical trials every day. Some even leave the U.S. to access these therapies. If you hear of effective treatments among your members, do you raise it to the VA? Anybody? Is that information passed on? You know, with our younger veterans, um, there are many effective programs like CPT. They have electronic program. There's different programs for the younger veterans where it's fresh, right. still in their memory. I find that what I'm hearing from my era back, not only Vietnam, Korea, and even a few World War II stragglers around, that we're very honored to be in their presence, is that it's not as effective dredging up those old memories. I'm gonna ask Director Elam to expound a little bit more because she also has her hand on that pulse. To um, address your question specifically, yes, when we do hear about new um, uh, treatments, even alternative treatments, you know, we're always curious about what VA is doing. And certainly we encourage um, VA to give us briefings on different uh, treatments for PTSD, military sexual trauma related um, PTSD. So we think that is an important thing to continue to grow and see what's available and what veterans want to use is often not more of a standard treatment, but some of these um, new treatments that are available to them. Do you encourage members to uh, <clears throat> report anything that's helped them? You know, anything that's been successful? Yes, and we've actually done a couple magazine articles about some of the different um, new drugs and treatments that are being provided that would be co considered alternative treatments. You know, if, if a veteran claims a certain alternate treatment has helped him, what does the DAV consider successful enough as a result to share with the VA? Is it, does it have to be a certain number? Well, we think that you know, research is important. VA is very focused on evidence-based treatments, and we encourage them to expeditiously do any, you know, research that's needed. We want to make sure these uh, treatments are effective and not, not harming in any way. Yeah. Thank you. Commander, uh, in your testimony, you also mentioned the dissatisfaction among veterans with the community care referral process. I, too, I think we all are dissatisfied with the red tape veterans go through to get referred to a provider in the community, especially as it relates to treatment for substance use disorders. What experience have your members had with accessing treatment clinics in the community through the community care system? You know, the, the care in the community process where you contact your primary provider first to get the referral to the uh, other resources available and understand um, we encourage those being utilized if and only if the VA does not have a specialized uh, person that can address that within the mileage or time element uh, aspect. That being said, however, you're 100% right that it's not uncommon for veterans being asked to wait four to six weeks or more just trying to get a referral and then you get the runaround. So we need encouragement when it comes to that because we're very grateful and appreciative as far as to have these services available to us. But like I said, um, we have to just work on refinement. We have a good foundation. Care in the community was a tremendous uh, benefit for the veterans as far as when we can't access other specialists. It's, it's um, kind of like an alternative. Sometimes we can get uh, telemed but telemeds aren't always going to address the situation where you need a face-to-face because -face, many veterans respond better when they're sitting across from somebody than looking on a screen. But um, 
thank you for bringing up the point that yes, we have challenges, but challenges mean that we're doing something in the right direction. We just have to refine it. Yeah, yeah. Are you hearing a lot of lengthy wait times? Is there a lot of, a lot of wait times for, for our, our vets? Sometimes, and again, once again, many times it depends on the availability of whoever they're trying to access. Sometimes it's just with the, the paperwork glitch. But the VA is very much on top of that, and the secretary does have a hotline. We have real good relationships with the secretary, and when we find a particular problem area, um, he usually addresses it right away to make sure that we can rough out, smooth out some of these rough edges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Coverville. Uh, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to explain to the DAV members who are here, what's going on? If you think the computer system at the VA is inadequate, there's, they haven't figured out where, how to schedule committee meetings. Uh, two floors above us, I'm in a, in a meeting of the Armed Services Committee on Ukraine, a, a, a meeting that I think you will all agree is, is, is worth going to. So Senator Tuberville and I, if you see us bouncing back and forth and in and out, it's not a lack of attention or interest. It's because we're trying to do our duty as best we can to the multiple responsibilities that we have. I just, I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, where are all these people going? We're not going out for coffee, I can assure you. Uh, uh, Commander Parsetti, uh I want to look ahead a little bit. The VA estimates that in the next 25 years or so, uh, the number of veterans over 85 is going to go up by like 40%. It's going to be a huge demand for long-term care. I don't expect a, a short answer here, but I want to put the DAV's good thinking to help us think through this problem that I think is coming at us. Much better to prepare and think ahead rather than to react to a crisis when it sweeps over us. Is that something the DAV can help us with? You bet there is, Senator King, and thank you for that question. But I'm gonna give you the short answer. Director Marshlack, can you address that? <laughs> hey, I like that deal. Yeah, I'll take this one, Jim. Um, yes, we see the impending number of aging veterans uh, coming. In fact, it's one of DAV's critical policy goals for this year and this Congress. And we really want, we know veterans want to remain at home as long as they can uh, with their loved ones and their family, and that requires support. Um, when we do need uh, community need living centers or nursing homes or state veterans home, that's key to have that option. But there's so many steps in between from assisted living to veteran directed care, just to having support in the home to be able to maintain there. Oh. So we wanna work with you to- I'm a great believer in home care. I've never met anybody yet who wants to go to a nursing home. Right. Uh, you wanna stay home. It's also more less expensive for the, for the, uh, for the taxpayers and I just think that's something, there's a bill that we just reported out, Elizabeth Dole Home Care Act. We want to yes. keep working on that. Help us get that through the Senate. Absolutely. We will be 100% behind you there. In, in, a, in just a, a few seconds, the other issue that I'm really concerned about is the transition. And you mentioned that, Commander, in your comments. That's where there's a disproportionate number of suicides in the first two or three years after the separation. I hope you can work with us to develop a program of a truly warm handoff. I've told the Department of Defense and the committee upstairs in armed services, I think they should spend as much time, money, and effort on the transition out as they do on the recruiting in. And I hope that's something you can help me with. Senator, the DAV would be honored to support such uh, legislation because the transition is critical. And giving our men and women the encouragement, resources, programs that they deserve to make a successful transition, and I'm not talking from a pharmacological perspective right now, I'm talking from a peer perspective right. where they can help each other and be guided by the, the professionals in a way to where they're going to be able to reestablish self-respect, self-esteem, and self-worth that they can re be reestablished not only within themselves but within their communities. Well, my, my vision is a is a VSO uh, officer meeting the veteran at the airport, saying, "Welcome back. Here are the resources that are available to you." Literally, I'm not. I'm literally meeting them at the airport 
to know that there's that community of veterans in their state. That's, that's the direction I want to move in. Thank you very much, Commander, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go back upstairs. Thank you, Senator. Senator Bozeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first of all, I've got to give a big shout out to my Arkansas folks. Thank you for making the trip and the great, <clears throat> the great job that you do at home uh, representing the state. And uh, again, all you do for veterans. Commander, thank you. You and your team do an outstanding job. We really do appreciate that. I had the opportunity to serve in the, uh, in the House on the Veterans Affairs Committee and now in the Senate. And uh, I know firsthand that, that we've been able to achieve a lot, but it simply wouldn't have gotten done without your help. So thank you for your advocacy, the idea of looking out and seeing so many people sitting here talking to their representatives. Uh, there's just no substitute for that. So uh, again, that's a big deal. Uh, the VA Careers Act is a crucial piece of legislation for reducing vacancies and staffing shortages in the VA. VA has continuously been at disadvantage when it comes to recruiting and retaining the most talented medical professionals across the country, especially in rural areas. Can you briefly speak to what this legislation would mean for the VA and why it's important to ensure the VA has the ability to recruit and retain the best healthcare professionals. You bet. You know, I've had the pleasure of serving under three secretaries of the VA right now on veterans rural health, and it's always the very first topic of conversation. What can we do to recruit and retain those professionals? But to give you further information, I'm going to defer over to um, Director Elam to expound a little bit more. If I may. Thank you. Dave is a proud sponsor of that legislation. We know right now that it's more critical than ever um, to be able to hire and recruit the best and the brightest for VA. Our veterans deserve no less. And the bill is uh, jam-packed with provisions that will really help to do that. Um, it's essential they're competitive. VA is able to be competitive for some of these scarce medical specialties. And again, our veterans deserve to have the very best and brightest, and we're happy to be behind you to get that across the finish line. We appreciate that. And one of, one of the things that we were, were able to get put in it was having to do with um, all directors being detailed to different positions, being gone for long periods of time. Leadership truly does make a huge difference. Can you talk specifically about that, about not having leadership in place uh, at the medical centers yes. and filling those. And it's hard because, you know, we're competing with uh, the private sector and they, they probably pay them, you know, many times more. On the other hand, we simply have to get those positions filled. And we really appreciate that provision specifically because we know when um, a, there's poor care that happens or a problem, it's usually a place where the leadership has been lacking or they've moved somebody you know, in and out that wasn't able to be there to really advocate and make sure that facility is run you know, top notch and be able, has to be able to secure those, you know, attract those people um, that have the experience and the ability to really run a medical center. It's right. essential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commander. And again, thanks to all of your team for the great job they do and for all of you that made the trip and do such a tremendous job in your states. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Bozeman. Ranking Member Takano. Uh, thank you, Chairman Tester. Uh, Commander Presetich, uh, I just got to personally uh, express my gratitude for uh, just the courageous way uh, that you uh, have spoken about your own personal struggles and uh, what a great service you are uh, to veterans who are struggling themselves uh, to know. Um, uh, but yeah, I want to. I'm going to reiterate probably something that's already been reiterated here, but I think it, it needs reiteration. Republican leadership in the House has suggested funding levels for departments and the agencies should be capped at fiscal year 2022 levels, while the Department of Defense is held harmless. In the case of VA, that would mean a loss of $31 billion, or roughly 24% of VA's budget, just as Congress has tasked it with implementing the PACT Act, opening uh, up medical eligibility for uh, 3.1 million veterans. As members of the independent budget VSOs, DAV has vital insight into the annual budget and VA funding. Do you believe 
uh, that uh, this uh, stake, uh, this stance that the, the House Republicans have taken puts veterans' access to care and services, uh, services to, uh, um, um, access to care and services in jeopardy? Congressman, thank you uh, for bringing it forward because any cuts to our veterans would be devastating financial cuts. These men and women have earned the right to get highest quality care, and we are not insensitive to budgets and things of this nature, but we have already paid the price in full many times over. Some of who didn't make it back, they paid the ultimate price, and those of us left behind, I think we deserve the best. Well, I do too, and uh, what uh, was demonstrated uh, in an unprecedented way uh, was the way that the, the political will was generated by you, the veteran service organizations, uh, to change the way that the federal government and this Congress have looked at uh, toxic exposure. Uh, no longer uh, should you uh, have the burden of proof on your shoulders, but you should have the benefit of the doubt, in my opinion. You should be given the benefit of the doubt. And we created the Toxic Exposure Fund so that funding toxic exposed veterans uh, would not pit you against other veterans. There wouldn't be a Hunger Games uh, played uh, by veterans having to compete against one another and more than that, for veterans to not compete with programs that benefit all Americans. Uh, and so uh, uh, you can count on me, and I know that you can count on Senator Tester, that we're simply not going to stand for uh, any kind of talk uh, about uh, uh, returning to uh, 2022 uh, funding levels, uh, which would put the VA and all veterans uh, just in an untenable place, and uh, I hope that as all of you visit uh, folks on Capitol Hill, you let them know uh, the true skinny on all of this. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Takano. I appreciate those comments, and I don't usually have you speak for me, but I like those comments. <laughs> That's fine. That's good. <laughs> Uh, we appreciate it. Look, um, I, I'm going to close this out, and I'm going to close it out by uh, thanking the DAV. Um, you got some of the best folks on the Hill that you could ever get. Uh, these folks are straight shooters. They tell us what you need. They don't BS around. Um, and I'm going to tell you, because of the DAV's influence up on the Hill, we've been able to get some good things done. So all you guys' memberships and gals' memberships out there, just know that they're doing really, really, really good work representing you um, in Congress. I, um, I've been here long enough, both as a ranking member chair and as a member of this committee, to watch people come up and, and, and give you lip service and, and then do things like, fist bump on the Senate floor or vote against a budget that, that actually funds things like the PACT Act or the Deborah Sanson Act. You guys see through that stuff. And you guys pull away all the, the, the chaff from the wheat and make sure that we're doing our job. So what I'm saying to you is thank God for the DAV. Thank you guys for the work you do. And Thank you very much. Joe Parsetich, Commander Parsetich, uh, you make Montana proud. Uh, we appreciate you being here. I want to thank you for giving the 2023 legislative priorities for the DAV and putting them out there very clear and forthright. We appreciate that. Look, folks, we've got a lot of work to do ahead of us. Um, uh, we've got a couple great committees here. Uh, I don't want to speak for the House side. We've got a great committee in the Senate. Uh, and we're going to work together to make sure we do right for the veterans, but we've got a lot of work to do, and your input's going to be critically important. With that, we'll keep the record open for a week. If you had additional comments you'd like to put forth, and this hearing is now adjourned.